Hi, students. Good morning. Okay, so it's uh, uh, it's now lessons. Okay, after having uh, two weeks holidays, I hope you took the time to actually revise back some of your work, and uh, so we start afresh. So we're actually at chapter eight. So we're going to continue with chapter eight today. Okay, so we're going to go to an interesting part of uh, classification of organisms. So we're going to concentrate on microorganisms today. Okay, so in, in, in the today's lesson, actually 8.3 is quite long, okay? We have to learn about the classification of the different types of microorganisms. And also we need to talk about the role of microorganisms. What do they do, okay? What is their importance? What is their function in our uh, life? Okay, so now today I'm going to just, go, just going to concentrate on the characteristics of microorganisms. Okay, that will be enough for the today's lesson. Okay, now first of all, I'm going to share screen. I think you can see this now, right? Uh, can I please have a feedback on the comment channel or comment box here if you can hear my voice? You can hear me loud and clear. I will take attendance at the Google Meet afterwards, all right, after this lesson. Uh, I will go in and take your attendance and you can view back this lesson at any time. Okay, maybe you can comment anyone who's here, uh, my 5S4, or maybe there are other students who are around, you can also comment. Okay, now I can see that. All right, yes, can hear. Okay, good. All right, okay, I'll check your attendance later, so I do not want to waste time now. Okay, first of all, let me go through uh, the definition. All right, now, it's most importantly, you need to know, first thing is, what is microorganism? What can be classified as microorganism? Okay, so in your textbook, all right, I will not use the textbook entirely because the facts are not enough. So here you can see, this is from the textbook. Okay, there are five uh, major groups. There are five groups in uh, microorganisms. So remember the five groups. Uh, okay, I'm going to go through one by one, their characteristics and the examples. Okay, let's go through this. Now, what uh, do we call as microorganisms? What is the definition? How does uh, one organism be classified as a microorganism? So it's based on this fact, right, that they must be microscopic. That means they are very small. Okay, they are microscopic microorganisms. That means they cannot be seen with your eye without any help, without any optical uh, device. They cannot be seen with the naked eye. That means we cannot look at it with our eye without using anything to help us to look at. That means either a microscope or a magnifying glass or something like that. Okay, so it can be seen with the help. It can only be seen with the help of a microscope. So usually the range of size uh, it has to be less than one millimeter in diameter. Okay, usually lah. Usually that is the uh, basic classification. Uh, it's so small that because the smallest you can see, okay, you can take out a ruler and you can see how small one micro, uh, one millimeter. Okay, if you look at your ruler, usually you measure in terms of centimeter, correct, right? Centimeter. And then if you look at the smallest division of one centimeter, it's one mm. So usually anything smaller than that, okay, one mm, we will uh, need help to look at. So usually anything that is uh, from anything less than 1,000 micrometer, which is 1 mm, we will cons consider as microorganisms. Ah. Okay, generally speaking. Ah. Okay, so here they are, most of them are unicellular. I'm not saying all, ah, because there are some which are multicellular. Okay, so most of them. Right, let's look at the five groups. Okay, if there are any questions, you can just type here. I'll come back to it later and just have a look at your... Uh, okay, so far nothing, yeah? Right. Okay, let's look at the five main groups of microorganisms. So they are based on their characteristics. So each group have different characteristics. So let's say if you find a new organism, okay, and you want to group them under any of these groups, you need to compare them with the compare it with the uh, existing characteristics. So first of all, you can think you ask yourself: Does it have chlorophyll? Okay, or is it unicellular? Okay, these are the things that you ask yourself when you look at you get a new specimen. Is it microorganism? Uh, is it uh, uh, does it uh, make its own food? Does it have chlorophyll? Okay, if yes, it does. Then it cannot come under, uh, let's say fungus or fungi. 
Okay, so these are the characteristics that we use to identify them. Okay, let's look at how to remember. I'm going to teach you how to remember your five groups. Okay, B for bacteria, P for protozoa, A for algae, V for virus, and F for fungus or fungi. So fungus is singular. If it's plural, we call it fungi. Okay, so it, you can use it interchangeably. It's all right. Okay, because in science or in biology, we don't really look for your grammar mistakes. We want to see the actual, uh, the meaning is correct. Okay, how do I remember this? Or I will, I, this is, I'm giving you a suggestion. Maybe you can find, make your own base of remembering. Okay, B for biology. P for physics. A for R. V for very. Fascinating. F. So biology and physics are very fascinating. <laughs> okay. You may not agree. You may find them very boring or you may find them very, very uninteresting. All right. But it is some a way for you to remember. Lah. Okay. You can put it fun if you want it. Yeah. But I find it uh, more applicable to say fascinating. Lah. All right. It's very fascinating actually. If you look at a lot of things that are around us. Okay, you can choose to change it up to you. But the main important thing is I want you to remember, okay? B for uh, bacteria, P for protozoa, A is algae, V is virus, F is fungus. Okay, biology, physics are very interesting, are fascinating. Okay, let's look at this. Now, first we go to bacteria. Okay, bacteria, I think I see some new comments here. Ah, okay, right. There's nothing much there. All right, now let's look at this. The label that I've highlighted here are these are the important parts you have to remember. Okay, important parts. Let's look at these common characteristics of bacteria. Let's look at one by one. All right? if we, enough, these five groups is enough for today's lesson because there are a lot of facts from here. So common characteristics, number one, they are unicellular. So most bacteria, they are in fact unicellular, but some can be existing in groups. That means they are, exist in colonies. We call it colonies. So one bacteria will be too small for you to see. But when they exist in colonies, you will see one block there. One block there. Normally when we do a bacterial uh, we call it, uh, inoculation or we do some tests with bacteria, we will put it on a petri dish where we have agar. Agar is the food, all right? And then we will put the bacteria there. We let it grow. So when you see one big block there, it's actually not one bacteria. When you can see it with your eye, that means it's definitely you have thousands and millions of it over there. It's called a colony. But if you take out one of it, it's actually existing in a uh, unicellular form. Okay, so it's unicellular. They can be only seen, uh, they can only be seen under a microscope at high power. Okay, I'll tell you later how big they are or how small they are. Okay, one of the characteristics is they have cell wall. But their cell wall is not our plant cell wall, which is made of cellulose. It is made of peptidoglycan. So peptidoglycan is a substance which is a combination of protein and also a, a type of carbohydrate, which is a polysaccharide. It's a complex polysaccharide, carbohydrate, and combined with protein. So it is peptidoglycan. Peptide, when you see the word peptide, it means protein. Okay, Glycan is glycose. You know, glycose or glucose, glucose or glycogen and all that. That means it is a carbohydrate. They do not have true nucleus. Uh, you learned this earlier, like before your holidays, okay, when we talked about the six kingdoms. All right, can you tell me if these bacteria do not have true nucleus, what is the name that we give them? Okay, out of the six kingdoms, uh, there are two. Remember that do not have true nucleus. What is the name that we give them? for these organisms that do not have true nucleus. And for the one with true nucleus, we also have another name. So out of the six kingdoms that we learned earlier, two of them do not have true nucleus. Another four will have true nucleus. Can you tell me? Maybe you can type it in the comment box here. Okay. Maybe I'll come back to it later. You keep on typing because it'll take a few seconds to come back here, so I'll carry on first. All right, now, so I want the name. Huh? What is the name of this organism which do not have true nucleus? What do you call them? The general name. 
So now let's look at the, what's the genetic material. They have, of course, genetic material, okay, because they can multiply. Bacteria are definitely, they are, a, they are very efficient machines of multiplying. In fact, they are so efficient that in 20 minutes, you actually can get a new generation. You multiply within 20 to 30 minutes, you get from one, you get two. From two, another 20 minutes, you get four. Another 20 minutes, you get eight. So they keep on multiplying. Okay, now. So they exist. What kind of material do they have? They have DNA, okay? And this DNA are free-floating. They are scattered inside the mito uh, cytoplasm, and they call it the nucleoid. And then remember, you do not have a membrane around it. So you never, never draw a membrane of a nucleus for the bacteria. That it, it doesn't have a nuclear membrane. Remember that. And some bacteria have an additional thing called plasmid. So they also have something extra, which is extra genes. And plasmid is actually in round shape. It's a circular uh, gene. So normally we'll do it in a circle. Okay, plasmid is circular. All right, you can see over here. So plasmid. And food is stored in the form of glycogen granules. They have flagellum. Flagellum is basically just like a long tail. Okay, just like it's very similar to the uh, flagella or the tail of the sperm. Right, where you have this thing, it, it helps to movement actually, it helps movement. So let's look at the structure. So you have a nucleoid, which contains DNA material. You have another additional uh, plasmid, which also contains DNA material or genes. Okay, flagellum is singular. If you want to have more, some bacteria have more. Flagella, okay, flagella is uh, plural. And capsule. Now there has a pro it has a protective covering. That protective covering is called capsule, which is important for the bacteria when it wants to remain dormant. When the conditions are not favorable, that means when it's too cold or maybe it's too hot. All right. That means it's not suitable for the bacteria to live. So this capsule will help it to uh, remain dormant and it's at the resting stage. Okay. And this is a cell wall. And remember, the cell wall is of peptidoglycan material. So these are the facts. Uh, these are the things that you need to remember. And sometimes you will see all these little hairs on the surface of the bacteria. You see all this? They are called cilia. Okay? Cilium is singular, so cilia is plural. Now, how do you differentiate? It also helps in the movement. Cilia is short and there are many. For flagella, you only have a few, or maybe one or two, or maybe a few. And it's much longer. Okay, so that's a different thing, flagella and cilia. They both help in the movement, to help in the motility, okay, the locomotion of it. Now, how small are they? Okay, are they? So we call, uh, follow the one in the textbook. I see there's still no answer here. Okay, so I shall give you the answer. If you look back at your answer, uh, at your earlier lessons, there are six kingdoms. Out of those six kingdoms, two of them are actually what we call prokaryotes. So pro... Okay, you can refer back to it later. Prokaryotic organisms are organisms who do not have a true nucleus. That means there is no membrane covering it. So they are prokaryote. And the opposite of prokaryote will be the eukaryote. Okay, I think you've forgotten already. Yeah? The lesson was like what, three weeks ago. Okay, you have to retain that information. Remember your SPM until like how many months later. Okay, prokaryote. Is the one with the nuclear uh, material. Okay, so here remember bacteria, they are always prokaryote. All right. Now, how big are they or how small are they? I follow the textbook, it's one micrometer to 10 micrometer. How small is a micrometer? So I've mentioned to you earlier, I think I, I can't remember either your class or another class. Okay, look at your ruler. Okay, look at the smallest division that you can see smallest division you can see okay and that would be one mm okay look at the one cm one cm you divide into 10 right so that one small uh markings there that 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 distance here is one micrometer which is one millionth of a meter one micrometer how do you draw it with a long tail like this is a micro i think you learned that in physics ah, okay so this is one micrometer now in that uh, 1 mm, all right, 1 mm, uh, 1 mm is 1 mm, all right, you can see here. You divide that little space there into 1,000 times. 
whatever you can see your 1 mm here you divide into 1000 small divisions and that small division is a micrometer so you can imagine in that 1 mm you can fit 1000 bacteria side by side not a whole lump you know that means your bacteria you put side by side you can fit 1000 if it is one micrometer okay 1000 into your 1 mm space so you can imagine how small they are so in other words if i could convert this in mm in your 1 mm you can fit 100 to 1000 bacteria side by side so therefore it means your normal microscope are not able to see this you need to have a very high power microscope okay you have to magnify at least uh, let's say uh, 1,000 times or almost 1,000 times, then only you can see uh, some, maybe you can see the bacteria. Okay, so normal microscope will not have that kind of resolution. Okay, type of nutrition. Ah, okay, so here, uh, generally speaking, uh, I would want you to understand there are actually two types of nutrition for all the organisms in this whole world. There are actually two types of nutrition. All right. Now, before I go through this, I think it's better I show you this to show you the classification of nutrition. Okay, I want to bring all the way down here. Uh, classification. Uh, for you to understand first, uh, when I see all these terms. Uh. Okay, now why is this? Let me bring up there. All right, now types of nutrition. There are all together, okay, generally speaking, two types. First, autotrophic and heterotrophic. So I want to give you this term so that you understand when I speak it over there, when I talk about the bacteria, what type of nutrition. Okay, autotrophic means, you see the word auto? Auto means, as you know, automatic, right? So they can do things themselves. So when you see the word auto, that means they can produce food by themselves. Okay, where do they get the energy to produce the food? So it could be from the sunlight, like photosynthesis, okay? Sunlight, that means they're using the light energy. So that would be photoautotrophic. Ah, that means these are the ones that use the light energy to produce their food. Okay, photo autotrophic. Autonomous can produce own food. Then another group, what we call chemo autotrophic. Now, this is the ones that you've learned earlier, the archaea bacteria. They are able to convert, uh, they use the energy from the chemical reaction converting one substance to another substance they use that energy to produce their food okay so this is using chemical sorry they're using chemical energy so they are called chemo autotrophic okay these are a lot of those that can convert uh ammonia into methane and that kind of stuff okay so that we will see later i don't want to confuse you so you need to know that autotrophic are those organisms which are able to produce their own food but where is the source of energy could be two types one could be energy from the light which we normally know like the green plants with the chlorophyll they convert light energy into uh, food into starch carbohydrates okay that's like photo autotrophic another one is chemo autotrophic they use chemical the energy from the chemical reaction they are able to convert one substance into another substance and that releases energy so they use that energy to make their food. Okay, now let's go to the next group, which is called heterotrophic. Hetero means a lot, many different types. Okay, like uh, we say in Cantonese, la, we call it lap chap. <laughs> lap chap, you know lap chap, not very chapalang, la, that's called hetero, means many different types. Okay, so when uh, hetero means they cannot do it, they, they cannot get the food themselves, they have to get it from sources that are outside. They have to get the food from outside. That means they don't make it them. No. Just, just opposite from auto. La. Auto means you can make your own food. Hetero means you cannot make your own food. That's all. Okay? All right, next. Heterotrophic divided into three different types. One is saprotrophic, holozoic, parasitic. Okay? Now, what is the difference? First of all, heterotrophic, they don't make their own food. So they must get it from somewhere. Now, get it from what? Or where for saprotrophic okay saprotrophic let me put okay saprotrophic they get the energy from substances which are decomposing that means these are dead organic matter dead organic matter 
things are not alive anymore, like dead bodies, right? Uh, trees, the bark, they are rotting away. So they are able to uh, absorb the energy, absorb the food, sorry, absorb the food from these things which are dying. They are decomposing. So they live on things which are already dead. They are not alive, okay? So let's say a uh, carcass or a plant that is, or an animal that is already dead. So you have bacteria there, right? You have bacteria there that is breaking down the tissues from carbohydrate. You break down into more or uh, less complex molecules. Protein, break down. Lipid, break down. Because all these are in our body. We have carbohydrate, we have lipid, we have enzyme, we have a lot of things. These are all organic matter. So they are converting. This bacteria is converting all this organic matter into something more simple. So you're going to get uh, maybe water, you're going to get carbon dioxide, you're going to get all these are very simple organic, uh, simple inorganic matter. So they're changing organic into inorganic. Okay, so these plants, uh, I'm sorry, these saprotrophic organisms, they live there, all right, and they're absorbing the nutrients from there. So they're saprotrophic. So a lot of fungus, a lot of the bacteria, they come under this group because they are living on the dead things, okay? And they get energy, uh, they get food from that. Okay, holozoic. Holozoic are very uh, simple way of thing is you eat the food, okay? You bring the organism, you bring the organism, the tissue and everything into your body by eating it, ingesting it. So let me write it down. Huh? This is through ingestion. So us lah, humans, right? We eat through the mouth, right? We eat the food, we put into our mouth and then we go into the body. So we are actually ingesting it. Ingesting means eating lah. In other simple terms ah. So this is ingestion. Okay? Ingestion is bring inside. E ingestion is bring it outside. Uh, that one is tapian. That one is, uh, you know, uh, producing your waste, uh, producing your, 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 your feces and all that. So saprotrophic is um, through, we call it, um, what are, uh, through, uh decomposing uh, they decompose organic matter lah, decompose organic matter and then they get their food from there okay so with all this understanding when i give that word later on you will not be confused what is it what is teacher talking about don't know what all these words okay once you i give all this it's very clear okay next one ingesting that means uh, a lot of animals are uh, I mean, for example um, the chicken eats the uh, whatever the, the the rice, all right, and uh, rats eat whatever the smaller and in insects. The tiger will eat the rat and so on, or eat the whatever rabbit and so on. We are also under holozoic. We bring in the food and our body digests it inside. For saprotrophic, is actually digestion which is outside. They digest the enzyme will digest the food there. You get the food and it absorb inside. Okay, parasitic. I'm sure you understand parasitic from the parasites. So they have this organism that live inside or it can be outside the body of another organism. That organism is called host. The host is like the, you know, the tuan rumah, all right, the host. So you have a parasite, it can be live on top. Let's say uh, this is my skin or my body, right? I may have some parasites living here, okay? I It could be uh, my mosquito is also a parasite because they absorb food, uh, absorb our blood, all right? So they're parasitic. Uh, in my intestine, I could have worms. So that is also parasitic. That is inside called endoparasite. This is ectoparasite. Outside is called ecto. So they get food by living. Sometimes they could come. They also have to live. They get and absorb their food from the host. Okay. So they get the food, the, the food from the host. But the difference here is the host is still living. Yeah? For saprotrophic, the host is already dead. So parasitic is still alive, okay? Whatever the host is still alive. So they absorb, for parasitic absorption, or absorb food from a living host, okay? So you see, uh, living host. For this one, is dead. Uh, so that is sometimes students get confused. What's the difference, Sarah? Saprotrophic also absorb ma. Parasitic also absorb ma, isn't it? What's the difference? Saprotrophic is the host is dead. Parasitic, the host is alive. So that is the difference. Okay, so now you have a clear picture. What types of nutrition? So all the organisms, and we're going to look at it afterwards, the five uh, groups, uh, they all fall under any one of these. Okay, now we go back. Uh. So let me see if anything here. 
Mm, okay, nothing. So far, nothing. Uh, we can uh, maybe you can leave your questions until our Google classrooms, then we can you can talk and then you know easier for me to uh, go through. Okay, let's go back to here. Here, okay, sorry. Here. So now, what type of nutrition for the bacteria? Now there are two types. There could be some bacteria are autotrophic. Some bacteria can make their own food. And some bacteria cannot make their own food. It's heterotrophic. So they have two types. Okay. So they come under some are autotrophic, some are heterotrophic. So for photoautotrophic, they have chlorophyll. They can trap the energy of the sun to make their own food by photosynthesis. It means they got chlorophyll. Then for chemoautotrophic, they use energy from chemical reaction uh, okay, to produce their food. Okay, for some so this chemo, one is photo, one is chemo. Just like I mentioned earlier, lah, the division there. Hetero. So under hetero, you have two types. Either they are saprophytic or parasitic. Okay. Sorry, a uh, jet fighter is flying over here. Lah. Okay, so saprophytic, they break down the dead organism. So you see this clear word here? Ah, so dead already. They digest the matter externally. That means how they will, they will produce the enzyme that, and the digestion happens outside their body. It's called external uh, digestion. Then after that, they will, uh, they will absorb the materials inside their body. Okay, then for parasitic, they live in the host. And this host is not dead. Okay, if it's dead, uh, that is not considered parasitic. It will become under saprophytic. They get the food from the host, all right? And some of them, this bacteria, they cause disease. Huh? So they're called pathogens. They produce, they cause diseases. So there's no good for humans. Okay, and also animals. And let's look at the class types. Example of bacteria. Now, this lacto lactobacillus, uh, this is a very, very famous one. You have seen in advertisements of Vitagen and uh, Yakut. Huh? When you see the lactobacillus, this is a group of bacteria which uh, we make use of in converting the fat from uh, food, like for example, uh, you know, um, in milk, okay, converting it into cheese. We also use this kind of bacteria, lactobacillus, okay. And for the one which is good for our gut, our gut is our da tang, our it is, uh, large intestines, we have this good bacteria called lactobacillus acidophilus. This is the genus name. I'm sure by now you should remember uh, how to write your gene, your, your species name. The first name, if I just like this only, this is the genus only. And you see the SP here, SP means it didn't specify the species. So then always the genus and the species must be slanted. That means in italics. Okay, so this is the genus in Lactobacillus. That means Lactobacillus has many types. It could be Lactobacillus cassii, Lactobacillus acidophilus. So the species name, we just make it general, just put SP. And SP, no need to italicize. Means it's the normal writing. Okay, so this is your lactobacillus, E. coli, Escherichia coli. Okay, this is also a kind of bacteria which we find in our stomach. Uh, sorry, in our this uh, large intestine. Salmonella. Uh, this salmonella causes food poisoning. So no good, All right? Salmonella. It is the bacteria that causes food poisoning, which can you find in contaminated food. Okay, how do you classify? uh bacteria okay actually there are four groups that uh, we will follow the textbook lah, right this is the basic uh nasa we learned it that way also so cocus cocus is round shape so bacteria have very specific shapes if they are round one cell of that all right on its own is round shape spherical just like a ball we call it cocus and there are many different types of cocus sometimes they exist singularly we call it micrococus and sometimes they exist two by two okay they exist like in partner like that we call it diplococcus. And some of them exist in a long chain. The bacteria, each bacteria are joined together in a long chain. We call it streptococcus. Okay, an example of which is a streptococcus pneumoniae, which causes pneumonia. Feiyan, which is actually a text, it's called pneumonia, it attacks your lungs. Okay, another one, you see this staphylococcus. They are like, uh, all these bacteria are grouped together like a bunch of grapes. Like a, I don't know, all bunched up like that, like a group like that. Okay, Staphylococcus. One example of this is the one that attacks your uh, throat when you have influenza, so you get your sore throat and all that. And also, it also attacks your skin when you have your boils or your 
uh, we call it the acne or pimples. Uh, all these are uh, pimples that attacks your skin and all that. So Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, the species name is aureus. Okay, so you have uh, under coccus, you have four different groupings. Uh, okay, and bacillus. If you cannot remember the this one, never mind. You remember this at least. You have to remember the four different groups of bacteria. Bacillus is based on the shape, which is a rod. So it's long and thin, all right? Long and uh, just like a, a rod, long rod, lah, okay? rod shape. Single, you can have a chain. You can flagellate. Flagellate means you have flagellum. Flagella at the ends, usually one on uh, both sides. Huh? And uh, spore. Okay, spore means they have really formed into spore. Usually when the conditions are not so good, Right when they is too hot or too cold or maybe lack of oxygen, they may form into a spore. Okay, next one, spirillum are spiral shapes. Spiral means it's like ribbon, so it will curl like that. Okay, so they have this shape like that. Ah, uh, so we call it spirillum. Okay, and another one is vibrio, which is a comma shape. So it shapes like a comma, like that. Okay, so this example I can give you is the vibrio cholerae. Viva cholerae is the uh, bacteria which causes uh, cholera. Okay? We call it o aucing. Uh. We call it uh, taun. Taun in BM. Uh. So you have the person vomiting, right? You have loose stools. The person go to the toilet many, many times. It's very watery. The person is dehydrated. Okay? Can cause death uh, if you do not uh, replenish the uh, water in the body and so on. Okay? So very extreme cases of diarrhea sometimes are very extreme cases right? person vomiting the person can be dehydrated you may have got drips okay may have hospitalized okay so these are the four groups of bacteria okay well how do they reproduce so basically bacteria they reproduce by binary fission they go under uh they carry out asexual reproduction so like i mentioned earlier bacteria are actually very efficient machines of reproduction they can, as fast as 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes, they can have a new generation. For humans, you need to be at least 20 over years old to have your own baby, right? <laughs> when you have, a, you have your next generation, about at least 20 years, you get your next generation. So bacteria, that's why the reason why you have so many millions of bacteria in one ceiling, single colony is because they multiply very, very fast. Okay, under optimal condition, that means very good condition. What condition do they like? They like it moist. Water, yes, water. It's warm. Okay, not too warm. Lah. Okay, the best is, of course, room temperature. Lah. Uh, not room temperature, 37 degrees Celsius. There is nutrient. It's warm. 37 degrees Celsius is moist and it's dark. Okay, each cycle of uh, division takes about as little as 20 minutes only. And if the condition is not good for them to reproduce, they will form spores. Spores that you have a shell, or you have something to cover it. And in a spore form, uh, the bacteria actually can be dormant. They can withstand high temperature. You can boil it, right? The bacteria doesn't die because the outer covering is very strong. It protects the bacteria. You can boil it. Uh, of course, uh, below 121 degrees. Uh, you want to kill spores, you must go under, uh, it must go uh, to 121 degrees Celsius and 15 psi, pound per square inch. Then you can kill off your bacteria. Okay, They can live for many years. All right, That means your spore will be there if the condition is not suitable and it will be dormant for many years without food, without air. It can be still in your, it can be in your fridge now. It can be with your frozen food. It's frozen there together with your meat, okay? So that's the reason why when you take out your food to thaw, thaw means to defrost, if you're not using it, you do not defrost your food. Because once you thaw it or once you defrost your meat, your bacteria, when it comes into room temperature, whatever spores is there, will start to germinate and you will have start to spoil. Your bacteria will start to act on the food and it start to spoil it. So it's always a good practice never to thaw it and never to re, uh, defrost and then re, uh, we call it freeze it again because you have already activated your bacteria and then your bacteria will start working on your food, breaking down your food. Okay, so basically, you know, I like to add in a lot of general knowledge. It applies whatever we learn, we apply in our daily life.
Okay, so when spores fall into a suitable medium, uh, let's say now it's a spore, right? It's not suitable to grow. But once it go into come in contact with water, uh, and the condition is uh optimal now, uh, that is warmth, it is room temperature, it is 37 degrees Celsius, okay, then their walls will break and then they will start to grow and they start to germinate and they start to multiply. So you have replication, division, you get more and more and more. Uh. So your, your food will be being spoiled. Okay, will be spoiled. Okay, respiration. Some are aerobic. Some, they need oxygen to survive. And some are anaerobic. They do not need oxygen. Mm, okay, so they are, uh, they are, that's why they're so successful as three bacteria. It's quite difficult to kill bacteria if you don't have the correct uh, antibiotics, you know, and the correct uh, conditions. So because they multiply very fast and they some even don't even need oxygen. You can find in conditions in places which are under very low oxygen, you can have bacteria there. Okay, so habitat they are live in fact everywhere. They are on our skin. They are inside our body. They are in our mouth. In fact, now you have a lot of them inside your mouth, right? You have water, air, soil everywhere on the table, everywhere, and for your fingers as well. Okay, so that's why you never eat without washing your hands properly, right? Don't put it in your mouth, right, and all that because you could have bacteria. There. Okay, so we have finished the first one. Okay, protozoa. Now, protozoa, they are basically, we can call it like little animals. They are single cell. They are unicellular. They are little animal-like. That means they are very, uh, they can move. When you talk about something that's animal-like, means they are mobile. They are able to move. They can be living in aquatic or semi-aquatic conditions. That means they need water. Okay, and under low power, they could be up to like uh, more than one, uh, you can be, you call it, they are bigger than bacteria. They are much bigger than bacteria. You can sometimes be able to see a little speck there moving around in the water. That could be an amoeba. That could be a paramecium. Okay, because you can might be able to make out. You might be able to see it. So they move around. Okay, wait. Uh, they have nucleus, cytoplasm, and plasma. Really, they are actually eukaryotes. Okay, so they are eukaryotes. They have proper, we call it uh, nuclear membrane to cover your membrane material. So they are unicellular, they carry out all the seven processes of living, which is feeding, digestion, they eat, they digest their food, they excrete their waste product, they can they need oxygen, they respire, they can produce and they can move. Okay? And they have uh, they are they can respond to stimulus. Whenever you shine the light from one side, okay, they will move the other way. It means they are able to respond to stimulus. So there are the seven living processes. They move around using pseudopodia or the four feet, or they have cilia or flagellum. So pseudopodia is from amoeba. For nuclea and paramecium, they don't have pseudopodia, but they have cilia, they have flagellum. Okay, so that's the ways they move around. Okay, the kingdom is under protista. They come under protista kingdom. The size, okay, 5 to 250 micromillimeter, a uh, micro, micrometer. So if I were to convert it into mm, that means in 1 mm, uh, make it easy to understand, uh, okay? You can see 4 up to 200 side by side. Okay, that means bigger than your bacteria, uh, right? Bigger. So in 1 mm, you can get uh, 4 to 200. Okay, now what about their feeding? What is their type of nutrition? They are all, uh, they are heterotrophs, right? They eat organic matter just like amoeba. They will just bring in their, you know, their, their food into there and then they will digest it internally. Or there are some which are autotrophs, like euglena. Euglena, they have chlorophyll. So sometimes euglena can be classified under algae also, algae. Sometimes like this, uh, you can see this glucina sometimes come under algae. Sometimes they come under protista or this protozoa. So they can go into both because they can move and they also have chlorophyll. Okay. And some are parasitic. Yeah. These are the ones that causes diseases like plasmodium. They cause malaria. In the malaria, it's the disease that is brought by, uh, we call it um, mosquito bite. But the mosquito doesn't, doesn't cause the bacteria, uh, doesn't cause the malaria. It's actually the plasmodium. So plasmodium is the pathogen. Okay. And the mosquito just bring the uh, pathogen into your body okay the malaria uh, you have high fever and so on fever and after that you get very cold then your fever again very hot and then very cold like that okay and uh this uh, african sleeping disease called trypanosomiasis okay sleeping disease is brought by the cc fly 
the fly will bring this bacteria in uh, this uh, protozoa. So it can be parasitic, it can be uh, autotrophic, okay? So there are two types, two groups. Okay, examples, you just give a simple one. Uh, uh, paramecium, I'm sure everybody remembers from, from one. Paramecium, amoeba, so this one should be italics. Uh. So this one should be italics, this one should be italics. This one is correct. Trypanosoma and plasmodium. Okay, they also produce either sexually or asexually. If it's asexually, they are always binary fission for this uh, single cell. Single cell binary fission is a very efficient way of uh, multiplying for single cell organisms. Okay, they uh, they need oxygen. Uh, they are aerobic. Uh, they are not anaerobic. They live freely again in water, uh, in all these aquatic environments where there is water. Okay, also in our body as well. Okay, so let's look at all these examples. Ah, okay, just now, ah, these are the bacteria. Sorry, I forgot to show you the pictures. Ah. This is a bacillus, the real picture, bacillus. This is coccus. This is bacillus. Whatever, lah, bacillus SP. Lah. This is coccus shape. Now, this is three types altogether. You can see the coccus, the bacillus, and the spirillum. The spiral will look like ribbon. And you can see the flagellum or flagella because there are many of them. And you also can see the cilia on the bacteria. These are actual pictures taken under a, a electron microscope. Okay, what about you, Glad? Now we talk about the protista, okay, which is the uh, protozoa. This is euglena. This is how you draw a euglena. It has a single uh, flagella, single flagellum. And this is a real picture of it. Okay, you can see the flagellum over here. They have chlorophyll. Uh, this, of, this is a particular thing about the chlor uh, euglena. So sometimes they, you can see appear under, classified under algae because they have chlorophyll. For paramecium, they are, don't have they don't have chlorophyll. So this is what you how you would label it. There are two nucleus, it's a macronucleus and a micronucleus. Where's the, where's the mi uh, micronucleus? Then you have the uh, important thing is a contractile vacuum which are able to pump out extra water so they do not burst. Okay, you learn that in Form 4. When you have too much of water, fresh water, because they live in fresh water environment, so water may move in right, through osmosis, and you will find there's accumulation of water. If you do not have an organism, a, 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 what they call a mechanism for you to remove the water, too much water goes in, it can actually burst. So it will die, lah, right? So you can see where it, this is where the mouth is. This is the oral groove. The, what, the food goes in here, and then they will form the phagosome, which is the food, so cytosome, uh, cell mouth. Then after that, it's digested inside, all right? And then the anal pore, whatever that's not needed, it will be ingested, or they be removed at the other end, okay? So this is what they look like under a microscope. Okay, let's look at another one, amoeba. Oh, wait. Binary fission, uh, this is how they, they, they will reproduce, you see? One split into two. So they reproduce asexually and also they are able to undergo sexual reproduction. Ha, this is very, very weird. Huh? Conjugation. So two paramecians will come together and they will exchange genetic material. And then after that, uh, you're going to have uh, different sets, a uh, different uh, variation of the nuclear material. Then you're going to have your next generation, which is totally different in terms of genetic composition with your parent. Okay, so I don't need to look into into detail, uh, just to, for you, enough for you to know there's conjugation. Okay, amoeba. Now, this is how you should remember, uh, draw your amoeba. There is a nucleus with a nuclear material, then draw some food vacuum, plasma membrane. Uh, contractile vacuum also they have, but it's not the star shape. Just now the paramecium is like star shape. Okay, you see here, star shape. So here is just one round circle. There are two types of cytoplasm. One is ectoplasm, endoplasm, and they will extend it. That thing is called pseudopodium. Pseudo means false. Podium is feet. It's Latin, uh, Latin word. So it's actually a false feet. This is for amoeba only. Paramecium doesn't have that. Okay, paramecium used by uh, moved by cilia, cilia movement. Okay, so here they go. Finish, ah. Huh? Right, amoeba, this is how you draw. Right? You can see one that's eating it, eating the food, food being engulfed by the pseudopodium. Now, do not draw your diagrams or label diagrams by drawing arrows. This is wrong. In biology, you do not use arrows to indicate labels. 
because your arrow shows direction of movement. Something is going in. Yes, you can put arrow. But if you want to label something, you just label like this. And this is nucleus, so you should always put something here. You should never draw your nucleus as kosong. It is not a vacuum. If you draw like that, kosong like that, people think it's a vacuum. So you put your, you stipple, you call it stipling, dot, 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 dot. And you put nucleus without putting the arrow there. Okay, that's the right way. Now this is the actual one. And you can see eating here. All right. Okay, so it makes it more interesting for you to see the real thing, right? Okay. Now next, let's go on to algae. All right. Well, we ran. Okay, never mind. We just try to. Okay, algae. It is quite diverse. There are many different types. Some algae are actually small. They are unicellular. They are microscopic. But some are actually very big. It is like you know our seaweed. Seaweed, you don't need a microscope to see, right? Seaweed or your hoi tai, hoi chou, uh, in the Cantonese, we call it, uh, rumpai laut, right? You don't need a microscope to see because they are very big, but they are all under algae. So algae can be very small and algae also can be very big macro, okay? So this is very, very tight. You know, they are not specifically just say microorganisms, uh, even though algae is considered microorganisms, but it's only for the single cell and the small ones. But the big ones are also under algae. Okay, so they are most simple green plants. Okay, now, why don't, if you say green plants, why don't we call them as plants? Why don't we call, put them under plantae? Why must we put them under algae? Okay, the reason is, very important, for algae, there is no differentiation of tissue to have roots, shoot, or stem, uh, wait, uh, roots, stem and leaves ah uh, they don't have they are uh, they do not have root stem and leaves unlike plants plants you can see you hold up a plant i can see oh this is the root this is the stem this is the leaf you can see it's very distinct that's why you put it under plantae but for algae if i hold up an algae or a seaweed like i don't know i'm not sure where the root i don't know where's the stem i don't know the leaves so it is not distinct that's why we call it as algae. They do not have distinct parts of uh, leaves, stem, or root. That's why it's algae. Okay? So, like, let's get example, Clamidomonas. Look at the bug. Okay? I'll show you pictures afterwards. And also the brown algae, which we call fucus. Okay? So, the picture in your textbook you have. Uh, uh, not algae. Where's this? Algae. Sorry, this fungi. Now, nah, here. Clamidomonas. This is uh, really very enlarged because it's microscopic. And this is fucus. This is algae. This is the brown algae, okay? Or we call it the brown seaweed. Okay, here. You've got, it has got chlorophyll. All of them have chlorophyll, which makes algae look green. Some have extra pigments to make it look brown or black, okay? So they are made of cellulose, okay? Ah, this is, this is important in uh, classification. There is no vascular tissue, no roots, no stem, no leaves. That's why we cannot put them under plantae kingdom. Yeah, and most of them can form spores for reproduction, okay? They can use flagella to move. Now here, under algae, there are many different types. Some are very beautiful. In fact, they are like geometric shapes. They are called diatoms, okay? Some are called dinoflagellates. They are so beautiful that they are very small. And they are actually food for little, little fishes. They are food for all these little, little prawns. And of course, the little fish will be eaten by the big fish and so on. Okay, so, so these are food for actually the diatoms, the phytoplanktons, they are called phytoplanktons. They are food for the small little creatures in the ocean. Okay, now protista, how small are they? So in uh, 1 mm, you can fit uh, 0 0.1 to 1,000 algae. Or in 1 centimeter, you can put 1 up to, that's not, 1 is very big already, uh, 1 to uh, 10,000 algae, 10,000 algae. So some are very small, some are very big. Okay, so examples, red algae called chondrus, the autotroph because they have chlorophyll. Remember, once they have chlorophyll, that means they can make their own food. So it is autotroph. Okay, green algae, phytoplankton. Uh, so all the phytoplankton, uh, all that they can produce. Remember, you eat all this uh, uh, green algae, uh, we call that one, some food supplement. Remember chlorella, chlorella, and uh, what they call that, uh, chlorella and also Spirulum, uh, spiril, spiril, spri, spirula, I think spiril. That one you can eat as a supplement. They are all algae that you're eating. It is good mineral source of minerals. 
Okay, Chlamydomonas, Spirogyra, Volvox, remember these names, huh? Blooming algae, Nostoc, Fucus, Laminaria, Diatoms, huh? they can produce sexually and asexually. They carry out aerobic respiration, so they need oxygen. They all live with, they need water. They all live in areas which have water, lakes, ponds, okay, anything that is wet in the long tongue also as well. So look at the pictures. Ah, this is a, I think, Volvox, okay. Diatoms are so pretty, you see. They are almost like geometric shape. Okay, and they have silica as their outer shell. So it is like glass-like, you know. It looks like glass, so beautiful. They are called diatoms, okay. This is a Volvox. Okay. Uh, ah, this one is very famous uh, a food in uh, Korea and Japan. It's like, they call it, it looks like a bunch of grapes. And you put in your mouth, it bursts. It's like bursting. Okay, it's a kind of delicacy. Uh, I don't know the name of the algae. This is algae. It's bursting on and all. It's like a juice one. <laughs> so this is the type of uh, delicacy. Yeah, it's, you know, Japanese and Korean, they have it there. Yeah, they eat it. Now, this is the ones you see all this in your aquariums, right? At the base, at the at the, at the bottom of the lake or all this. Uh, all this algae. Okay, this is Volvox. All right. Uh, so these are all the algae. Now, all these algae. This is a brown algae. And you see this algae on the surface of a lake. You see so dirty. Ugh. You scoop out your hand, all this green thing that you see floating on top of the lake or the long tongue there, huh? that is your algae. Okay? Right. And including the algae that you eat, your seaweed like that you love so much, huh? that is also algae. Right, let's go to the next one. Uh, what is it? Fungus, fungi. Okay. They are also plants. If people think it's a plant, it's actually not a plant because they do not have chlorophyll. Ah, the most important thing about algae, fungus is fungus, no chlorophyll. Okay, and algae has chlorophyll. So you can imagine uh, fungus are never green. Fungus is always gray, white, or black. Okay, gray, white, or black. They are never green. So they do not have stem, they do not have roots, or they don't have leaves. They can be uh, seen yeah, because they're microscopic, uh, microscope at low power. They can be seen with low power. In fact, sometimes you can see also on the bread, overnight bread, or bread that's already expired, you can see white hair on top or not. Okay. Once they become older, they become uh, brownish and then become black. Uh, that one is a sporangium already. What you see, all these black, black things, uh, they are ready to burst. They are ready to release their spores. So you see the white, white things is all this mycelium. The hairs on top of the bread that is expired. Okay. Now they are mucor. This is called mucor, which uh, is quite like a bread mold. This is a bread mold. The mold that... Uh, 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 grows on bread. Okay, so what are the characteristics? They have cell wall, but the cell wall is made of chitin. Chitin material. Chitin material you have seen in insects also. What is chitin? It's a fibrous substance consisting of polysaccharide. It's a type of polysaccharide, that means carbohydrate, which makes up the exoskeleton of arthropods. Arthropods are all these insects, uh, right, insects group, and also the cell of fungi. So they actually have chitin. So it makes it a little bit hard, just like the insect, like the, what, the shell of the shell, right? So it has chitin. And then, how do they eat? They secrete enzymes. So the enzymes will come out and they go into the what? They go into the host. And then, it breaks down, that means digest outside your body, the ex called external digestion, and the food is absorbed back inside the body, inside this uh, organism, uh, inside this fungus. Uh, okay, they have colorless, thread like structure called hyphae. Uh, what is the difference, hyphae and mycelium? Hyphae is just one. Hyphae, the white color strand that you see, all right, on top of the bed, that, that's hyphae. But you have a lot of it, a mass of it, all intertwined like a network thing, right? You call it a mycelium. Understand? So hyphae is just looking at one strand as a hyphae or hyphae. Hyphae is singular, hyphae is plural. Then you have a lot of it, it's called mycelium. All right? And they are large uh, because mushrooms, they are not unicellular, they are multicellular, they are usually large. But yeast is sing unicellular, so they could be unicell or could be multicell. If yeast is unicell, but mushroom, all these, uh, they are definitely multi-cell. You can see all these different different types of mushrooms. Uh, this one we can eat. Okay, the Buna, what Shimeji mushroom you can buy in the pack. 
form. Eh? Now, all these interesting colored mushrooms that you see, all this growing up in your garden or whatever after rains, please do not eat eh? because a lot of mushrooms are poisonous. Okay, unless it's certified to eat. Eh? So you can see some are so interesting. Your cup shape looks like a cup, cup shape, and these are like a spongy one. There's so many different types of fungus. A mushroom, right? Eh? Mushroom is another name for it, but fungus is a general name. So it's all mushrooms are fungus. Okay, so you can see this is like from the same group as the lingji, eh? we call it ganoderm. Okay, so they also grow on trees and bark because they are growing on uh, dead matter. They're growing on trees, they grow on the soil, they, they, they do not grow, they are not parasitic, they are saprophytic. All fungus are saprophytic. So they grow on dead uh, trees that are rotting the stem or whatever. This is yeast. Ah, this is yeast. This is unicellular. But they occur, of course, they do budding. Huh? You can see the budding. All right. You see they are rep rep uh, reproducing by budding. You see all the baby buds coming up. Once they bud, they, are, they come out as a small one, then they will detach and they, uh, they will become bigger and then they detach. Then you get an individual. Uh, this is the bread mold. This is the mucor. When it below massa, you see the sporangium, they're still white. Once you see them black already, uh, that means already mature, ready to break open, ready to spread. Okay, you see all these this other uh, mold. Uh, this is, yes, this has been magnified, the bread mold, mucor. This is the sporangium. The whole thing is called sporangium. And inside, you have all these little, little spores, all right, ready to they carry the genetic material of the mucor. Okay, so this is the mycelium, the, the, the what they call the network is mycelium. One of it is called hypha or hyphae. Okay, okay, let's go on to the next one. All right, you got two more to recover. Huh? Sorry, it's taking some time because I'm oh, already finishing. Yeah, okay, good. Oh, one more thing. How do they multiply? I think I've already mentioned. Huh? Uh, so unicellular is for yeast. Okay, multicellular is for all the others. Lah. Okay, and... Uh, Type of nutrition is saprophyte, yes. Like I, like I mentioned, saprophytic, they will live on dead organic matter. Okay, some are parasites, okay, some are parasites, but mostly they're saprophytes. Huh? Okay, and how big are them? Uh, are they? So, in one mm, you can fit 10 to 100. Okay, of course, mushroom much bigger. Lah. Mushroom it doesn't qualify under here. Lah. Mushroom, you don't, it's so big, right? You can see it with your, with your, with your eye. Reproduction asexual, budding for yeast, and mostly they are just. Like mushroom, they will produce spores. Okay, they carry out uh, anaerobic respiration. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, for yeast, yes. Okay, but for the others, like mushroom, they need oxygen. Dark and damp places, yes, they prefer dark and damp places. They will live on decay or die organism. So they are all saprophytic. Okay, lastly, uh, virus. Virus is interesting. Uh. This is the smallest group of all the five groups. They are the, all, all the five groups, yeah, they are the smallest. They are the smallest. In fact, they are so difficult to see. You need, you only can see them with the best uh, micro, electron microscope with the highest resolution. Okay, under electron microscope, huh? you cannot even see with a normal microscope. Now, the most interesting about virus is they are not, they are not, not classified a living thing also. It's not a cell. It's not cellular. There's no cellular material. Why? Because you don't have nucleus you cannot call nucleus that there is no nucleus there's no nucleus there is genetic material though there is dna but it's not in the nucleus there is no cytoplasm you cannot label cytoplasm there you also cannot label cell membrane so these are the three important characteristic in order for you to call it a cell it must have cell membrane or plasma membrane it must have cytoplasm. It also must have nucleus. Then you can call it a cell. But because the virus doesn't have any of these three, you cannot call it a cell. So it's called acellular. Okay, but it's also microscopic. And it's very difficult to kill them. The reason is because uh, they can exist in a non-living state. And once it enters a cell or it enters you or let's say you're a living thing right it enters you attacks you it infects your body it goes into your cell it will become alive huh? that's why it's so difficult for us to control viral uh this virus eh? because it exhibits living thing uh characteristic which is uh it can it will able to infect organisms it will multiply right it will multiply 
whenever owned, but only if it's in a cell. And they also exhibit non-living organism uh, characteristic. That means it doesn't breathe. There are no respiration, all right? It, you can put in a small form, it can exist in an environment until many, many years. It doesn't even die. There's no such thing as dying, all right? So what is inside virus? It is made up of a sink of nucleic acid. So there is a genetic material, which is inside the core in the middle. And there's outside here called capsid. So there are only two parts. You need to label two things only in a virus. You need to label the genetic material and the capsid. Capsid is a protein coating. It's a coating that protects the internal, uh, the DNA material. Okay, so you need to label the capsid and the DNA, uh, the uh, nucleic acid. So it can be RNA, it can be DNA. It depends on what type of virus. Virus can have RNA, virus can have DNA. Okay, they are called genetic material. So they can be either DNA or RNA, but they are not, they don't have both. Okay, so they have both the characteristics of living things and non-living things. Like I said, it's acellular because you don't have your cellulose. I'm uh, sorry, I don't have your membrane. Uh, nu you don't have your nucleus, no cytoplasm and no plasma membrane. Okay, so characteristics of living things. Why do we call it living things? Because there is nuclear material and they can reproduce, but only if able to infect a living cell so that's why they're always looking out for hosts okay if you're alive all right a bacteria will all come and look for you they will come in and they will come into your body and they will go into your cell and they will use your cell to produce themselves okay now that is the mechanism of reproduction okay non-living things they also care uh, they also have a characteristic of non-living they do not carry out any metabolism they do not respire they do not feed they don't even excrete and they can be crystallized, okay? Just like salt. Salt is like you consider it's not a living thing, right? It can be crystallized. You can stay forever. You'll be there, for, there forever, okay? And there's no signs of life. Once it's outside a living cell, once it's outside your virus, it's like literally no life. But once it attack you, it'll come to a life. It'll come alive. You will be alive and you will harm you, okay? So it cannot be placed in any kingdom because, you know, these things are... It cannot be considered a living thing. No characteristic of living things. How small are they? Ah, in one millimeter. One millimeter, the one you can see that, the small millimeter. You can fit 2,500 up to 50,000 side by side, you know, which is so small. Okay? All viruses are parasite, can cause diseases. Ah, that's why viruses are no good. How many types? They have very distinctive geometric shape, very beautiful, some of them. You have a tadpole shape like this. Ah, look like a <laughs> like a tadpole, eh? with the head and the tail, or whatever. They are called bacteriophage T4. Now, please don't worry, they only attack bacteria, they don't attack human. Some are round, spherical. Example, AIDS virus and also your coronavirus, right? Okay, so they are round and with outer protein layer, they have also extension. They have extension to hook on to attach onto the living host of the cell. Okay, they are rod shaped just for the tobacco mosaic. This one they attack the tobacco plant. It doesn't attack human. AIDS, of course, attacks human uh, and animals. Uh. So tobacco mosaic virus, it attacks the tobacco plant. So they are long rod shape. Okay, there are other geometrical shapes like the polio virus. This one attacks human, right? They have a geometrical shapes. So what is so special about them? They are only able to produce when they are inside living hosts. That's why they're always looking for hosts because this is the way for them to reproduce. Okay. And then what happens? They will inject their DNA inside. See, they inject the genetic material. This is your cell. Let's say this is your cell, your whole cell. They already managed to find a cell. So the virus will go onto this and it will inject inject this uh, DNA or RNA and it uses your material inside your cell to make copies of its own self. So it makes the DNA, it makes the capsid, it makes all the everything all. Now, of course, this is bacteriophage, not you la, in bacteria. La. And then after that, they assemble. They assemble, it's like chop, 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 everything. La. They assemble and then once the cell breaks open, you get more than one. So that's how they become multiplied. Okay, they use a whole cell to manufacture the parts of itself and they assemble inside there and they break open and they come and infect another cell. 
Okay, so that's how they can spread. Okay, they do not respire every bit, every habitat, they're all around the world. Okay, let me show you some pictures. Okay, so this is all right, this is the projection on the protein coat. All right, this is I believe this could be the AIDS virus. Oh, sorry, HIV. Uh, AIDS is the penyakit, uh, AIDS is the disease. So you call it if the virus you call it HIV, human immuno uh, uh human immunovirus. Uh, yeah, okay. Can't remember the actual name. Okay, then this is a bacteriophage, bacteriophage, bacteriophage. T4. This is the actual picture of a bacteriophage T4. Okay, and these are the parts. There's a head. So the genetic material is inside here, inside the head. And then this is a base plate here where you have needle like thing they can inject. They inject the DNA outside. Okay, and this is the tail to latch onto the bacteria. And uh, this is the tobacco mosaic virus. Okay, it is a nucleic acid right but in spiral form and there's also the protein code called capsid okay so you always remember in any virus you need to label two things please don't ever ever label your uh what nucleus cytoplasm or plasma membrane they only have two which is the capsid and the nucleic acid there's only two things you need to label and then let's look at how it infects here uh, you can see, of course, it's not a real picture. Lah. This is like animation. Lah. This is your bacterial fudge latching onto a bacillus. This is a bacteria which is bacillus. You can see how do I know it's a bacillus? Remember, it's a long shape. So, bacillus is long shape. So, this is a bacterial fudge T4, right? Which is trying to infect its DNA, uh, trying to inject the DNA material into it. Okay, so we have finished all the five groups. So remember, you need to remember the B, P, A, F, and V. All right. Back, uh, biology, physics are very fascinating. Okay. <laughs> to remember your five groups and the characteristics. Okay. So, all right. I will stop here now. Again, for the next lesson, we will go uh, another day. All right. We will go into the roles of microorganisms. That would be quite interesting as well. Okay. So, any questions here? I think I can. Uh, I can, uh, what do you call that, address them in our class later on. I don't see any other people from other, okay, who have in this class. So I will see you next, okay? So give me a few minutes to uh, get settled and then I will go into Google Meet. All right, okay? So I will end broadcast now. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, see you in another lesson. Bye-bye.